Perfect. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here today. And today we're going to be talking about HVR, right? Give you a little bit of uh, insights into who we are, uh, what we do, and how we do it. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin, right? So how do you realize your full potential of your data uh, with change data capture, right? So we're going to be talking about change data capture. What is it? How do you leverage it? And you know, how do we play into that? So my name is Doug Howdigy. I am a uh, sales engineer here uh, at HVR and uh, loving every minute of uh, working with customers and you know, showing them uh, how they can leverage uh, HVR for uh, empowering all of their change data capture or data integration needs that they have. Uh, for today's agenda, we will be talking about you know, the question of what is log-based uh, CDC, right? Uh, give you a little introduction of HVR, kind of talk a little bit more specifically, you know, one example area um, where we've had some very tremendous success, which is working with SAP data, right? So give you a little bit more focus, drill down on why that particular uh, use case as an example, but we have, we're, we're leveraged for all of the major data platforms that you can uh, think of, uh, but that is actually one of the standout ones and showcase a little bit of a customer use case study, you know, how, what were their challenges or their business problem? How did we solve it? And talk a little bit about that. So before we begin, let's ask the question is, what is log-based uh, CDC or change data capture, right? Well, we got to get a little bit of a definition there first. Um, so log-based CDC basically captures the information from transactions, right? And now you guys are all technical, so I won't, you know, bore you too much with some of these details, but uh, uh, just to quickly summarize, right, transactions are what is populated or written to a transaction log, and that is what uh, is used to read uh, or to do change data capture, right? So just a quick definition, transaction is basically any sort of uh, event or action that may impact multiple tables or one table, a single row, you might actually have a a transaction that um, is actually, or multiple transactions is actually impacting just one single row. So you, you can have a whole variety of different actions going on there against tables in a relational system, right? So you can have these quick transactions. You might have, you know, make a change in one form, make a change in another form. Or maybe you guys have uh, two individuals who are sitting down on a desk with their respective lap laptops logging into a form because they're wanting to order something on Amazon. And, you know, they're looking at the neatest little gadget they can buy, right? Say, hey, I like this USB, uh, you know, USB uh, uh, little fan, because it's great. Uh, when I get a little warm, I can just point it at my face. Uh, so you're purchasing these transactions or you're processing these transactions, right? But there's a distinction here in which who hits that button buy or who commits that transaction first? That is very important because, you know, I might be looking at something and I might be saying, hey, I want to buy this, but then somebody else might beat me to it, right? Even though I opened the page first, uh, the fact that I didn't hit the buy button means that I have not committed my transaction until that point. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that as we are capturing or as we are processing this data, we want to capture these committed transactions in the order in which they occurred, right? Basically, uh, another terminology for this would be making sure that we are delivering data or capturing the data in the order in which mutations are happening, right? And this is important to have what is called acid compliance, right? And being acid compliant means that you are guaranteeing or being consistent in your delivery of that data to a particular uh, location so that you can be rest assured that the order in which I hit click or somebody else hit click to buy is the order in which we are delivering that downstream to some fulfillment system that is saying, all right, Doug purchased versus uh, Joe Bob, right? Uh, but Joe Bob did it first. But even though, you know, we wanna make sure that we keep those things in order. So there are a couple different ways to process these changes, right? These transactions that have been committed. Um, one of them is, you know, obviously the, the, the core one, the fastest way is this log-based capture. This means we don't have to query anything, 
We don't have to ask the system, all right, what, what do you, what is an update? What is a delete? It's already written in this, in this binary format in these transaction logs. And it allows us to be able to read them as they were events, right? So we have very low latency, very high volume or high throughput, uh, ability to actually capture not just the changes in a record, but maybe if I extend my table, if I do an alter table, or if I create a new table, right? This metadata or the schema, I can capture this information because that is also written on these transaction logs. And so it's the best methodology or the best way to deliver changes with the lowest possible impact on that source. Another one that is, you know, that used to be leveraged and still is to this day in many places is a trigger-based change data capture where we're using triggers and queries to, to deliver those changes. That still allows us to maintain some level of consistency, but there's a heavy impact because we're now populating some sort of shadow table that is used so that we, we can query that table. And it, you know, it can disrupt things. It could potentially create table locks so that users might be you know, shut out from executing some purchase. And um, it is a very good way to keep track of that though, right? But it is not as good as log-based. Then our next uh, downstream mechanism is a query-based CDC with the ability to capture uh, the operation type and a context column. Right, so this way we can we know that hey, this is an insert, an update, or a delete event, and we can actually query the tables and then deliver that output to the respective targets. Right, so this was the more legacy approach um, that was utilized, uh, you know, like 20 years ago. Right, and then prior to that, when there wasn't a way to detect the events, we basically had to do an append only sort of system. You know, we had even the queries that had no operation type. And the only thing that we could do is maybe some context column on a date timestamp, right? So all of these, other than the log-based capture, all of these had a heavy impact on our source systems, which is why the entire trend is going towards only leveraging a log-based data capture because it's the most efficient, it's the fastest, gives us our lowest latency and allows us to maintain an event-driven mechanism. Uh, so think of it as uh, like the Unix command line tail that is tailing a text file. And the moment that some new piece of text comes in, it automatically launches or fires an event and we see some text in that tail output. Log-based CDC is something akin or similar to that, right? So again, just quickly defining what is log-based CDC. It's a mechanism of reading our, our transactions with very low impact in a secure way, right? Because now we can actually capture that data. Uh, we can encrypt that data and compress that data and deliver it. And we can do that in real time, right? So that's, that's the best benefit of this log-based CDC, right? So now a little bit about, now that we've discussed what CDC and you know, how that impacts and how it's, it's derived from transactions, we can go and delve into a little bit of HVR, right? Who are we? So HVR, we're, we're, we're a company that has a technology that allows us to move data in real time, right? So we have a lot of expertise in the data integration field uh, for a variety of different needs. Uh, we have over 300 customers. This slide is a little old. We are global. Uh, we have, you know, more than 200 years of um, engineering uh, built up experience across a variety of different platforms, right? So we have a whole bunch of knowledge on how to access data, how to deliver data, and how to do that at scale, and how to do that in the lowest latency possible. So this allows us to empower organizations um, to realize full potential. So whether that's reading a relational system, whether that's reading a, a data warehouse, like a legacy data warehouse, like a, you know, like a Teradata or a Vertica or an Ateza that's, that's you know, already been sunsetted, uh, whether that's accessing APIs like Salesforce or you know, these data lakes or cloud-based sources that you know, are being hosted like an RDS or Aurora sort of relational managed uh, database offerings we're able to actually capture that 
um, as well as, for example, SAP with all of its complexity, right? Has 100,000 tables, uh, has stuff called cluster tables, has things called pool tables, transparent tables, and we make sense out of all of that. We're able to capture that information, process it, um, parallelize that extraction, and then deliver it to a target location in record time, right? And more on that specifically in just a little bit. But what are those trends, right, that are driving this adoption for data integration, right? See, these are main use cases where you need to access multiple uh, heterogeneous sources um, and be able to deliver it to the cloud. For example, you might have projects where you have to go to the cloud. Maybe you have a, you know, a project where you're doing a you know, next generation data analytics because you're doing machine learning and you need to deliver and build an operational data store or maybe you have a data modern data warehouse modernization project where you need to leverage, you know, one of the main three um, cloud vendors, a modern data warehouse like a Redshift, um, uh, Azure Synapse, BigQuery, Snowflake, and be able to use, um, you know, to be able to deliver and build out, you know, your data warehouses and handle things like a type two slowly changing conform dimension. You know, how do, how do you manage the delivery of that and how do you organize all of that? So those are the different things in which we can help, right? And of course, let's not forget the operational aspect, the real-time analytics, right? Delivering to a messaging system, whether it's Kafka, Kinesis, or Event Hubs, or PubSub, or being able to just go to another relational target or a NoSQL system that is designed for true real-time delivery, right? So all of this, these different high level use cases or trends as I call them are what's driving the adoption for data integration, right? So what are our supported platforms? Uh, we have you know, all the major relational database flavors that you can think of, um, you know, SQL Server, Oracle, MariaDB, Postgres, uh, MySQL, uh, Sybase, Right, being able to access those. And we're also able to source from these uh, persistent storage layers in the cloud, right? ADLS, blob storage, S3, Google Cloud Storage, um, you know, Salesforce to access data. And something that is a little bit on the side that some folks uh, are not aware, uh, aside from the data replication aspect, we can also do uh, uh, data transfer. So accessing binary data or text data from FTPs or secure FTPs or even SharePoint, right? And deliver them to another location. Um, so a very common thing that I see is, hey, I want to access uh, some FTP data because I've got some JSON text documents and I want to uh, deliver that to, uh, to my S3. Or I want to take FTP data and I want to uh, do a uh, you know, copy into, right? So I can load straight into Snowflake without any additional processing. So those are some other ways in which we can help as well. And then of course, targeting to the vast array of different uh, targets that we do support, all of the top three cloud vendors, data platform services, Azure, Google, AWS, uh, and their respective RDS or Aurora versions of the database systems. Um, you know, whether it's Azure HD Insight for Data Lake, Azure Databricks or even Databricks Delta tables. Uh, same thing with the Amazon Databricks or Amazon EMR, Google Data Proc, um, and delivering to the storage layers. We can do all of those different things. And then we have, we're also able to deliver to some of these NoSQL systems, right? Whether that's Couchbase, MongoDB, Cassandra. And something unique here is this agent plugin, which is our SDK. So should you need to deliver something that you know, may not be quite standard. Uh, let's say you wanted to go directly to a big table, which is kind of like HBase, but there might be some additional authentication layers. That's fine. We have our agent plugin that allows us to, it's Python and it has a SDK framework and it allows us to, you know, leverage that so that we can deliver it uh, as part of implementation services. Uh, it's very quick to go in and develop something new. Some of the topologies that are supported because of the fact that we have so many sources and targets is the fact that we can deliver in a unidirectional fashion, 
Uh, that means like an active passive, bidirectional, which means like an active active, uh, broadcasting for those instances where you need to do read once and write many, which is kind of cool, but yet maintaining 100% ACID compliance, uh, which is even better. Um, or if you're doing a consolidation use case in which maybe you are a oil company and you have a lot of remote rigs and you, you know, they all have little mini SQL servers and you want to consolidate all those into a master central SQL server, you know, in your data center and you want to uh, deliver all of that data to a, to a standard schema or to the same schema, then you have a consolidation use case example. We can do all those different things because we can do some transformations, we can read the DDLs, we can extend out you know, or, or you know, process the alter tables. So DDLs and DMLs, we are able to deliver. Um, we can also help you in populating and building out your data marts and staging the data to a data warehouse like say Snowflake. And last but not least, something interesting, you know, if you have truly mission critical, whether it's on this planet or you know, in space, uh, or we have something called the multi-directional, which means it allows us to deliver data across multiple points and keep all of them in sync. Um, it's, it's so useful that NASA actually is one of our customers and they have an Oracle system in the space station that is synchronized you know, with Florida, with Houston and other locations um, to be able to keep up to date that information that is being generated from there. All right, so just to kind of summarize a little bit, right, of stuff that we're gonna be discussing is, uh, you know, we have this technology that's comprehensive, it's very efficient, right? It's a streamlined binary. That means it's like 100 megabytes in size that you can download. It's only one installer that you need to use. And when it's installed, it can be deployed, and I'll get into this a little bit more as either the listener or the agent or the hub or being able to be deployed as a proxy. So all of these are all done with the same installer. They just have slightly different services that you execute, right? Um, but it's very streamlined. We are designed to be able to do those batch loads or those initial creations, right? We'll create the schema on the target. We'll apply the primary keys to secondary indexes or unique indexes, uh, and then we'll deliver that data. We'll do the appropriate data type conversions uh, or we will provide you the transformation abilities to, to execute some of those conversions either on the capture side or on the delivery side, right? This means that you can either execute those functions on the source or execute those functions once it's delivered on the target. Uh, it's your choice depending on how you need to organize that. Execute the CDC, right? So not just those full loads, but reading that transaction log. We take a, a bookmark uh, on at what transaction ID we need to start reading and executing, kind of like a, uh, you know, we're, we're, store, we're playing that cassette tape from old school days and we're starting from that point forward. Uh, we have something that's unique to us, which is validation repair. This means that um, I can actually get a snapshot. I do a, a hash or a, really a checksum actually uh, on the table, or I can do that checksum at the row level so that I'm actually comparing things and guaranteeing. And I'm not just doing a simple select star or select count star from this table or something like that, right? Um, so you, give, you get a good guarantee that you're able to do that. And should there be a mismatch, we can repair that information. Uh, we have built-in monitoring. So the visualizations, how much data have I moved? What's my latency? Um, you know, how many tables do I am, 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 you know, how much throughput have I done? And then I get a topology view, right? So if I have multiple delivery uh, uh, locations, uh, either as source or target, I can visualize that as an entire high level diagram um, and be able to do that, right? So that kind of is the summarizes the main things that we will be again reviewing specifically. Um, a little bit of our, about our architecture, right? So I mentioned some terminology, agents, hub, proxy, all right, so agents get installed on the source database system. Um, it's very non-invasive. It consumes at the most one to two to 3% of CPU utilization. Uh, you know, I know a lot of folks might get a little bit, you know, antsy at, you know, hearing the term agents on the database, 
but rest assured, uh, that is how a, the vast majority of our customers are able to leverage things um, for their mission critical needs and deliver them to our hub. And our hub is basically our central repository. It's just another EC2 instance VM or, or just another server that has it installed. And this is what stores all of the statistics of that monitoring information. These are the one that controls the jobs, that stores the scripts basically of stuff to do. Like, do I have, do I detect some PDLs? Do I do some transformations? Do I fire off a, an agent plugin? Do I convert my data from this uh, Oracle system to Parquet? That's the one that's firing and executing those processes in that central hub. And then finally, we have a target, another, sorry, another agent on our target um, and be able to then deliver that at scale, right? And throughout that entire journey from source to target with our agent-based approach, everything is encrypted and compressed. So you don't have to worry about all of that. And the data travels from RAM to RAM. So it's a memory-based uh, data uh, um, replication process. Of course, we can spill over to disk should we need to, but uh, by and large, it's RAM to RAM. Uh, if you guys have firewall issues, of course, we have a solution for that through what we call our proxy. This allows us to simply um, imagine if you had five different sources uh, and you are capturing that data. What we do is we encapsulate everything through one standard protocol, one port. And so you are able to move that data from one location across your, in your DMZ, over across past your firewall to the other side through one port, right? This allows you to not have to worry about opening up multiple ports and having to deal with, you know, that network uh, headache, especially for a lot of the security guys really like this capability that no other technology has, right? And then delivering it to those targets. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, some of the visualizations that we have, so you can visualize a topology. So you can see the flow of your data pipelines as, as they are actually happening. You can see, you can click on them and see how many tables have been replicated. What is your current latency? Uh, you know, it's color coded. So if, if it's exceeding latency thresholds or if something's down, it shows it to you as kind of a you know, reddish color versus a light blue versus a deep blue. So you can kind of see how things are either operating, they're active, or, they're, or something's going on, right? So that way we can guarantee that at an, in a visual way, you can see if your SLAs are being met. Same thing from a monitoring perspective, you get a, a visualization built in to see your latency and throughput. Should any of these kind of fall out of a threshold that you can configure, then you can get a, mon a notification or an alerting of this information across different ways. It can be an email alert based on you know, latencies or issues with a particular task or job. Uh, you can be notified via SNMP protocol. Uh, Slack has a direct Slack integration as well as SNS. So if you wanted to integrate it with notification in Amazon, for example, you would be able to do that. Uh, and I know, for example, like uh, Teams has a, has a uh, SNMP notification ability as well. So you could be notified in Teams. I know a lot of folks really like that. Uh, this data can be integrated with any visualization uh, system or any monitoring system. So for example, you know, not just the main visualizations, but it could be like the monitoring tools like uh, Dynatrace, uh, AppDynamics and whatnot, right? A little bit about uh, validation and repair. So what's cool about this is you're able to quickly at a glance capture Am I matching or not based on a checksum, uh, both at the table layer or at a row level, right? So it's really nice because I get a way to compare my system with another platform, right? So I have an Oracle source and I'm delivering to Snowflake. Do I match? Why, well, yes, yes I do because I have a checksum. Uh, do I match at a row base? Well, yes, yes I do, or maybe no, I don't. Hey, I don't. What would you like to do? Would you like to repair that? Would you like to you know, make sure that that's synchronized? Why, why yes, then you can click and say repair. And so very, very nice feature, right? 
And again, from a visualization, we are comparing that information and it displays, you know, in, in a very nice, quick way that breaks down the different types of comparisons that we've got, All right? Digging down a little deeper, YHVR for SAP, All right? I mentioned at the beginning, that's kind of one of the standout uh, we've had a lot of success with SAP, right? So why HBR for SAP, uh, you know, whether that's the R3, whether that's SAP on HANA or S4 HANA. Um, and the answer for that is because we are the only ones that are able to do a log-based CDC without having to impact that SAP application layer. We actually are reading that SAP dictionary. So we are actually interpreting the metadata or the the um, what I call the uh, data types, right? Because if, you, if anyone goes into an SAP system, into the database, for example, if it's powered by Oracle, you will see that everything's VARCAR. And then there's these weird tables, right? Tables that have, you know, an object, like a binary object that's got like data for another table. And maybe you have another table that has a lot of little embedded tables, right? or there's just thousands of tiny little tables that really make up one larger data set, right? That's SAP for you. So we're able to access that without having to have a transport. Basically, that means no ABOP, no BOPI, no load on that SAP application side, right? And be able to deliver that information, right? And as we're doing that, right, we can, you know, deliver this to a data warehouse or a data lake and you are then able to do a few little minor things on that uh, HVR layer, right? This is the transformation part. A little bit of a, about how we manage that. So everything that we do is moving it in an ACID compliant manner, right? So it's streaming that information in the order in which transactions are committed. We can add some things, for example, we can add columns. We can extract some of the metadata that is stored in those transaction logs or redo, sorry, transact, yeah, T logs or redo logs or journals, depending on the platform. And we're able to then uh, move things like a timestamp, give me the SCN number or LSN number, give me my committed timestamp, give me the user who executed the transaction, you know, some other stuff, right? Uh, give me the event type. Is this an insert, update, or delete so that I can? flag things as I soft delete as I'm delivering to my data warehouse. So we give you those transformation abilities. We can also do the DDLs. Uh, we can do some lightweight transformations like modify, do some substrings, stuff like that, um, and deliver that information, right? So this would be an example. You, If you are building a data warehouse on Redshift, um, the benefit here is that you get to if, if your interest is, hey, I just need a fast way to merge that data into Redshift, and all I care about, yes, I'm building a data warehouse, but it's a type one data warehouse, right? A type one means it's a flat data warehouse. It has no concept of uh, or needs any kind of surrogate keys or any you know parent satellite uh, table structures, right? Everything's just one-to-one -one, um, from your source system. So then you can deliver that and you can build out, you know, a type one only data warehouse very quickly with HVR. Right? But we do partner with other technologies if you need to uh, undertake the concept of, you know, additional transformations. So we, we are of the mind of uh, the, not ETL, but more of the ELT where we extract, we load, and then we can do transformations on that target, right? And one of our partners is Workscape that allows us to be able to do that, where we prepare the groundwork, right? We stage the data. Should you need to just have a type one, we do that automatically, you don't need anything else. Should you need a type two, we can store audit tables. Basically, it's like an append only that shows you the uh, event type and some timestamps and allows you to then merge that data or build out a history, set of history tables uh, so that you can have you know, potentially uh, type two, slowly changing conform dimensions or late arriving dimensions uh, because you're handling that. And given the fact that we're able to manage those, you know, DDL statements, should there be alter tables and add a new column or something, we can then handle that information as we stage that data, right? Both transactionally applying it to the target tables 
or applying it as changes, or we call them as audits on, on a, another set of tables that you would then merge uh, with your initial full load data set, right? So all of that would then be on the data warehouse side. But we prepped the groundwork for that. So a little example here is we have a company called Progressive Leasing, a uh, little case study here, right? So what did they need to do? Well, you know, their, their business said, hey, we got to respond faster. Uh, we have all these business needs, but you're not able to give it to me. Um, I need to do things, you know, to make decisions in, in a much more real time fashion. I can't be doing things in a matter of, you know, days or hours. I need things in minutes or seconds. Uh, but, you know, they, they grew a lot more, right? That means that they have more storage. That means that they, their existing original systems of record are starting to be, uh, you know, hitting their, their limits. Uh, so they so it's query bound. They can't keep expanding it, uh, and they needed to deliver uh, new visualization solutions. And it was just not efficient to do things manually. The old school, you know, transformations where you're doing scripts, SSIS packages, and you know the whole manual uh, rigmarole. And they didn't want to do that, right? They wanted to be able to handle the data if they needed to had more columns. They had some slowly changing dimensions that were arriving there. They needed to handle those things. And they wanted to move data in real time from their transactional systems, right? So they had SQL Server systems and they wanted to build a data warehouse structure in another SQL Server system. And they wanted to do it you know, reliably and quickly and in real time. So in comes in, uh, or here comes in HVR and we say, hey, you know, progressive leasing, uh, we can process this log by CDC for you, uh, thereby, you know, um, minimizing the query load on your source systems. We can do this in real time, so it's actually not going to impact, um, you know, your existing systems. And we can replicate the data in real time uh, in a very easy way, right? So not just replicate it in real time with no impact, but we can replicate it in real time in a very easy manner, right? So therefore they got faster processing times. Um, they saved a lot of time, right? Because they didn't have to code any of that. No more old school SSIS packages for them. And if you guys don't know, progressive leasing is kind of like the, um, they're a subsidiary of Aaron's and Aaron's is like uh, one of these rent to own places. And they're completely, progressive leasing is completely virtual. So that means you do everything via, you know, online via you know, a website or a mobile app. And you need to have the same experience doing that, um, you know, across various different interfaces. And HVR allowed them to be able to handle that replication need. And not only that, but it empowered them because now they had another layer with which they could, you know, offload those queries and be able to ask things, right? So with that, that concludes my presentation on HVR. Um, I'll now open it up for any questions anybody has on change data capture, on HVR, on our architecture. More than happy to. Any questions? I don't. I'm yeah, I have sure. a question. Yeah. What are the options HV, HVR has for changing schemas on the source side? So we can handle alter tables, right? Create tables. If you add a new table, we can automatically include that. If you change a table, we can manage, you know, the adding or dropping of columns. You change the data type. So if you can do it on your source system without generating an error, then we can process that. Uh, so, for example, if it's an Oracle system or a SQL Server system, you know, we would be able to read those changes and, and be able to apply them to the target, right, and be able to then expand that out. Okay. So, just a, as, a, as an example, let's say the source side adds a column. Uh, previous rows don't have any value there. What is, how does HVR handle that with, like, new data coming in? Does it just alter the table on the target system and then populate that? data from now on or that's correct yes so it alters cool. the table and adds that column um, and then 
will start populating things from that point forward. Uh, it won't move your defaults, right? So if you include any defaults, uh, you would want to include them as part of your uh, adapt DDL command. So let me show a little bit of the UI. You know, this, this was more of a conversational presentation, but I think it might help if I show a little bit of this UI. So you define these locations here, right? In any one of our locations, and we define a location, it's not necessarily a source or target, it's just a location. If you can, if you can configure any one of these, then you can either pull data or deliver data to them. Now, CDC might be a different approach, but you can still access the data in a batch manner if you need to. Uh, on some of these may not support them being as a source, right? Because they don't have a transaction log. Like Snowflake would not be a source, but we could still source from Snowflake, just not do a CDC. And then once you do that, then you have something that's called a channel. The channel then has a logical organization of a source and a target or what we call groups. And each in, in these groups, then we have the different changes that we want to do, right? So I've got something here called column properties and column properties lets me add custom columns that I want to do. If I have an expression to uh, or a function that I want to call on the source or, or on the target so that I can convert something, I can do so, which is kind of cool. Um, if I'm trying to do DDLs things, then we have something called adapt DDL. And this is what allows us to adapt that pattern and do what we need to do, uh, you know, be able to handle these, right? So we have the different conditions depending on what we're wanting to do when we're adding or detecting those DDL changes, right? And then processing them. Uh, same thing if we're doing this on the target location, uh, we have different things we can transform and we can execute a, a particular a script that we want to pass the data and then it's abstracting all of the uh, environment variables and all of the different uh, you know, uh, variables that are available from within here, for example, like the table name or something like that to pass it in here. Uh, and, and you have a whole variety of different things that you can do. Once you've configured your pipeline or your channel, you then have the job that is created. The job then will capture, for example, I have one here from HANA. This is a uh, uh, HANA DB system delivering to Snowflake. Uh, should I want to see the statistics of, hey, show me what's been going on, what's been happening, not just today, but over the last few days. You know, as I do demos, I capture this and I don't delete my statistics and I can kind of see a little blip. Like this morning, I had a little couch-based webinar where I was showing how we could deliver in high speed from a, uh, reading once from an Oracle system and delivering to Couchbase and to Snowflake simultaneously and to BigQuery, right? So showcasing that and then showcasing, hey, look at my topology here. Uh, everything's turned off right now. So that's why everything's this sort of pinkish reddish hue, uh, but it shows me a visual representation of what I have. Um, and then we'll have, an, well, you know, we can have another webinar where we just focus purely on a demo or a use case scenario, and we can showcase that if you all are interested, or, or of course, uh, you know, you can feel free to contact us and we can do a deep dive on anything that, that I'm Doesn't showing. Like there's uh, maybe a couple more questions in the uh, chat channel as well. Uh, all right, one yeah. second, let me see. Okay, read it out real uh, quick, start the recording. Right. So uh, Fitz asked, with the rise again of data virtualization and federation, have you seen any reduction in demand for CDC for uh, ETL. The, CD, the second part of the question is the CDC handle anything that might be helpful for a federated solution. So I would have to understand that a little bit more, but at the end of the day, in a nutshell, if you're, if you are, cons if you're federating like delivering data, you might have a need to deliver data to a streaming layer like Kafka and you are also delivering data to BigQuery, for example, right? A, a data warehouse layer, right? So one would be big data, the other one would be a fast data layer. And so you might be needing to do that and we're able to help you with that because you don't have to worry about how to access that source system so that you can federate that data, but yet maintaining that asset compliance. 
and the reverse would be true as well, right? Consolidating that data from multiple sources into a single schema. Um, the, the, the main benefit is this, is the fact that you don't have to write code. You don't have to worry about any expensive, uh, you, know, uh, you know, golden gate or anything like that replication that is more old school. Um, you know, having to do your homegrown query based CDC. You have this mechanism that is very lightweight, non-intrusive and able to move. Now, one more comment to that. I did not mention, I, I talked about agents, but we do have a way to also be agentless, right? For those who are interested in that. Of course, the agent approach allows us to be very high performing, uh, but that's not to say that we wouldn't be performant and still deliver real time for your particular use cases. It would just be something we would have to study. Yeah, are there any other questions about you know, CDC as an overall or, or maybe about HVR uh, that we can answer? Yeah, so I just want to make, uh, there is one um, comment here about you know, replace or product to replace Kafka and simplify the data lake load. So I will say, mention this one thing in regards to data lakes uh, and focus, for example, on S3, right? So not only can we automate the delivery or staging your data to that S3 and then loading it into the Hive layer as well, uh, but we actually can do a comparison, right? Which is kind of unique. So this means that you can compare your data from that Oracle system on that S3 or on that EMR or Hadoop or HD Insight. And you can actually get a value coming out whether or not it's comparing that. That is kind of cool. Or even if you're just delivering straight to the S3, we can actually do a comparison on that information. So I think you missed my question about uh, the price point and um, how you price your solution. And obviously it's you know a presentation to a large groups. So the, yeah, the so. pricing semantics are probably, but can you give us a ballpark of what the, the pricing mechanism would look like? Absolutely, I'm the technical guy here, right? So I will let Brian um, talk on the pricing model and how that's structured. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit on it real quick, but obviously you want to keep it kind of high level and kind of keep this conversation uh, technical, right? But uh, yeah, at a high level, it's it's an annual subscription uh, based on source and target connections. Um, so that's kind of how we price it out. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of other factors that go into that as well, but we'll kind of keep it at that that level for this uh, presentation. But if you want to know some more, certainly uh, reach out and we're happy to talk. I, the main question is what it's going to compare to uh, if we were to use it in our stack instead of Golden Gate, is it going to be less expensive than Golden Gate? Is it going to be more expensive than Golden Gate? Uh, oh, less. <laughs> less. Yeah. Less. Uh, Dart, Darty, I guess what what were you using uh, before? Were you uh, to replace Kafka? And those guys left after. The we time. used Stream. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 They were annoying. I think no, they said they were tired and mm -hmm. they were old. They were in like their seventies plus, and they were walking. And they were Any any other? And so I was like, Justin Quan would stay. Like we can just go play right. He's like, all right, dude. I don't. And any other questions? <laughs> Uh, what is the tech stack used to build? So HVR was built on, it is C code, C logic for the underlying access and processing. Our agent plugin does leverage uh, Perl or Python. So depending on, on what you like to execute and run. I have a question. So with uh, data warehouses like Snowflake, do you have any recommendations for the um, frequency with which you ingest data um, from HVR uh, into Snowflake? Yeah. So we give you the option, we, we separate the capture process from the, what we call integrate process or the, the applying of the transactions to the target. 
is specifically so that you can control, you're capturing always because that's what you want to do, but then it can be building up and queuing so that you're not constantly keeping alive or being chatty to that virtual data warehouse, for example, in Snowflake. And you can actually schedule that so that it is done, you know, maybe once an hour instead of, you know, there's no point in, 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 in applying transactions every second on a Snowflake data warehouse because, well, it's not a relational system, right? It's a data warehouse system. Um, and so most customers that we see, we observe that they elect to have, you know, 30 minutes once every hour, something around there. Makes sense. But you can schedule that. It's decoupled. We're the only technology in which we can decouple it that way, specifically designed for that consumption side. One follow-on question that, that I get quite often, um, with exchange data capture systems in your data warehouse, do you, do you have a recommendation for whether um, it's more appropriate to build you know, white tables or um, whether you should continue using a, um, you know, a traditional star schema? So the answer is for us, it can be one or the other, right? Uh, from a performance perspective, we're able to handle both. So we're not, we're not really concerned with, um, you know, the size or the breadth of, you know, how wide a particular column is. So for example, SAP systems, some of those tables uh, like um, you know, VBAP or VBAK, those have very wide columns, right? Uh, but, you know, as far as we're concerned, it doesn't impact our performance for us from a replication perspective. So there is no, for, from our side, there is no need to adjust one way or the other. And you mentioned uh, ELT earlier. Are, what's, what are you seeing in terms of the trend? Um, are, you, are you still seeing ETL being used um, a fair bit, or do you see a, more of a trend towards people using ELT as, a, as their main pattern? As the main pattern I see these days, the trend is ELT, right? Obviously, transformation has to happen. Otherwise, the, 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 the T and the ETL is still there. I consider it's more like ELTL, right? Uh, especially as you're going into the cloud and you're building a data warehouse or a data lake. You might be delivering, there might be a benefit from a speed and from a delivery mechanism, especially for data integration in staging your data. But then you want to do that iterative transformation from that stage data to procure your ODS for your data lake or procure your, um, you know, your, your highly normalized data warehouse structure. Right? And so you, you would do that transformation as you're building that data warehouse because you can always fall back on that stage data to do any additional you know, retransform, if you will, right? So it, it's, it's simply a nature of the fact that we now have cloud. I think if we didn't have cloud, the whole concept of ELT wouldn't probably you know, really exist. It would be, everybody would be cool with just, yeah, I'll transform in memory as in process. And if I need to, I'll just access it again. But the fact that we have this concept of a staging ground lends itself to definitely be more towards the ELT these days. What are some popular transformation tools you're seeing for uh, ELT? So we see a lot like Matillion, uh, especially building out these uh, data warehouse systems. We see a lot with Talend. Uh, you know, Talend's kind of like this nimble uh, transformation uh, technology that allows you to, to do things both on-premise or in the cloud. Um, and so we, we see a lot of that. Uh, Wearscape, of course, is one of our partners. And, you know, if you need to build a highly normalized uh, you know, third normal form data warehouse structure and handle type one and type two, then that is your go-to uh, technology that can handle those complex transformations, really complex transformations. Um, and of course, you're more traditional, right? We do see Informatica, you still see the old school data stage for those very large organizations, but those are starting to go by the wayside because they are, you know, they're, they're exactly ETL and they're trying to 
uh, mutate into this ELT, but they're not, they're still, you know, their, their technology foundation is still primarily ETL. So we see Matillion and Talend as kind of, and Wearscape as, as our um, transformation um, technologies that we partner with. What other questions people have? Well, cool. I think that wraps it up. So thanks, Doug. Good talk. Absolutely. No, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great to uh, share share who we are. Yeah. yeah. So. And uh, very nice to hear that there's a lot of jobs available there. That's, that's kind of unique. I've never been in any one of these meetups where you guys do a job. So kudos to you. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. It's one of those things I think we just like, you know, this tight net community, we just want to make sure everyone's looking out for each other and staying gainfully employed. So um, Microsoft Stack data flow is a current suggested uh, transformation with Databricks is getting pretty common. Interesting. Are you, uh, I'm just going by your I, username here, Darcy. Are you in the Microsoft Stack? Yeah, I'm a Microsoft principal engineer. Cool. Yeah. So one, one of the things I would mention there, though, is, is how do you access the data from the source, right? This is where we come into play in a very big way because we can deliver that CDC data and stage it. So if it needs to go to event hubs or if it needs to just be delivered to ADLS, Gen 2, or blob storage, uh, we can do that. Right, and then you can pick it up and continue that journey and do your transformations, and then deliver it to Databricks. We, def we definitely, we definitely embrace CDC solutions. Uh, there definitely is a lot of advantages to CDC, uh, that, and we definitely embrace them. I was just looking uh, through my designs to see how many I have, and I think I have about ten out of my last twenty designs that are using CDC. So. Uh, this is really interesting. Obviously, I'm really interested in in you, your um, your approach to CDC, but I don't think CDC is going anywhere. I think there's so many legacy systems that are distributed across different areas that people are going to always have that need to move data from one place to another in an efficient way. And and as long as you have a pipe between uh, between your source system and your data lake or your your data solution, you know, CDC is a really efficient way to bring it across the pipe and keep that traffic, you know, minimized. So I, I think you guys have got a great future. I, I think the CDC is going to be going, uh, you know, forward. And we use it just as you suggested. Um, a lot of times we use it as a streaming source and throw it through an event hub and uh, bring it in in that mechanism. But other times I just actually use it as a raw data source and have it, you know, dump into a, a data solution near the data lake and then harvest the raw um, like I do any other, you know, localized copy. So but I think I, I think you got this is a great solution to be talking about right now. But oh thank you. Thank you. No, absolutely. I mean um, you know and, and you're right. You know thank Take, for example, Lowe's. Lowe's, if you guys go and buy, you know, your hardware, you're ordering a door, and you see what they're using for their system, you still see a green screen. I mean, literally, they have an emulator um, that is emulating and go logging into a mainframe system. They're never switching that, right? All their other systems, their customer interaction systems might go NoSQL, Couchbase, what have you, right on your mobile app. But that core fulfillment system, that's mainframe. It'll never go away. So no, you're right. Do you expect, mm -hmm. this is maybe a product question that you may or may not be able to answer, but I mean, do you, do you think that HBR will, um, start kind of emulating, uh, you know, tools like your, like the five trans of the world where you basically just sign up with a credit card and just plug and play and get going in a couple minutes or do you, do you always 
is there going to be more of kind of an appliance nature to it? Do you think? So, so we are we are working and building a whole rest layer to our technology. We're actually going to revamp it. Uh, it is in this process this year. Um, so with that means and enables a whole bunch of changes, right? And it, it enables software as a service capabilities because now we have a technology that is a REST based uh, you know, uh, solution or design. So it gives us a lot more flexibilities moving forward. Um, I'm not gonna say what's gonna happen. I, you know, I firmly believe that we will always maintain as this enterprise grade technology, but we will definitely open up different ways in which you can access it. So uh, whether it'll be a credit card, I don't know. Um, you know. I wouldn't be able to Bitcoin. know about that, but, but it definitely will be something that can be procured in the cloud uh, as a software as a service, as well as on-premise software that you can install. It will be web-based, we'll have a REST layer. And so with that brings a whole slew of other possibilities, right? Sounds fun. Absolutely. Nice. Right, so I can leave it open for a bit if anyone wants to chat. Um, I'm just wondering about the raffle. What's sorry? What what's that? So is the raffle going to get announced now or later? Yeah, so we'll be doing the raffle after the we wrap up here. And then if you won the raffle, you'll be notified via the email that you put into the uh, the form. So okay. we'll, uh, you'll be notified probably, you know, first thing tomorrow. Cool. Um, well, that's it then. I'll uh, stop recording.